me for a design conference in San Francisco uh, as a way to make rent and uh, uh, rent out air mattresses and serve breakfast and you give them the stock <laughs> to their customers. Um, so that's his original founding story. But we wanted to kind of pick his brain about, like, kind of even way back then, uh, you guys were envisioning not just a product, you were envisioning this whole experience that you were creating. You make someone breakfast, you give them a subway, a pass, you give them a map. So how did you kind of think of that concept of creating this entire experience out of Airbnb even back then? What's funny is that, like, 2007, Brian and I, are our backs are against the wall. It's like, how do we make rent in a couple of days? And the design conference comes to San Francisco, the hotels sell out. We look at the extra space in the living room, and the, the two ideas come together. What if we blew up the airbed and rent it out to a designer? And as we started to think about in that moment, like, okay, well, if you are a designer coming to San Francisco, okay, you're, you're coming off the plane. Uh, from the minute that you land on the ground, what? What can we do to make that a comfortable transition into the city? Maybe you've never been here before. So we started to think through kind of, even at that point, this this end-to-end -end experience for guests. So that would be airport pickup. Okay, we'll go pick up guests from the airport. Okay, when they get to the apartment, uh, what do we want them to smell or see when they open the door for the first time? Well, it should smell fresh and clean, so let's schedule a cleaner to come right before they get there. Maybe we'll, we'll light a candle as well, just to put an aroma in the air. And then, as they see the bed, what can we do to provide a little delight, maybe a little mint on the pillow, or just fresh towels. Um, maybe have the breakfast goodies like in the kitchen so they can see that the, we'll the gourmet Pop-Tarts and the Cheerios and the bananas. Um, so we, even from the very beginning, we're thinking from, through this end-to-end -end journey for the guests. And I had something that that's kind of driven us all the way to here are five and a half years later. Why, why is that so important to you? Why did you do that from the very well, time. I think if you asked any designer, um, they would probably tell you something around the lines of design being more than just the way something looks. It's the experience or the emotion that you create for somebody. And you know, for us, uh, coming from industrial design, it's all about crafting the product experience. It's not. It's less about what something looks like or the material looks like. Well, how did it look like on the shelf? Uh, what was it like when you unpackaged it? What was it like when you used it? What was it like when you disposed of it? It's kind of look, look at the whole life cycle of the experience of whatever that product or service is. And the Airbnb's got what, served nine million guests total. Um, in the first four years, it was four million, and then the last nine months, five million. Um, so, and a lot of that's word of mouth, right? It's people recommending rec recommending the service to other people. So, it seems like your growth is directly based on that emotional connection. I remember. Uh, a piece of advice I got one time in the early days, which was, um, first of all, make something people want. That came from Paul Graham. Uh, and he, it, he's so focused on, on having us build a product and a service that, that people really wanted to actually solve a problem for them. And um, I know in the early days of any idea, you can, there's a thousand directions you can go. And actually, it can be very overwhelming, right? Because you, you have this initial idea, you have maybe a couple proof points or evidence. But how do you really know which thousand paths to go down? For us, you know, it was fairly overwhelming in the early days. Um, you know, uh, trying to figure out, okay, we, we have this experience, we think we're onto something. How the heck do we do we take this to the next step? Um, so Paul Graham really drove us to figure out something people really wanted. Um, and his advice, which is probably the, the single greatest piece of advice we ever got, was. Go meet your people. And what he meant by that was get out of the comfort of our office, go out to the world, and, and interact and talk with the, the customers, the people using Airbnb. Um, and it was in those conversations that we saw the, the right path. Right? We went from a thousand paths to one or two very clear paths in terms of how to evolve our product, uh, how to make it uh, consumable for the right audience that we were designing for, and um, it was in those moments that we, we kind of moved from like this kind of like a thousand path, where do we go, to like, all right, we talked to 10 people in New York or DC or Miami, we understood their needs, uh, let's go design for that. What are some of the key like transcendent moments where you realize, you know, this, this is the path we want to go on? What were some of those key decisions that you guys made? Well, let's see. Um, I remember. 
our very first payment system that we introduced was um, was rather rather kludgy. Um It took like eight steps to get through our checkout flow, and uh, it was like it was almost like an obstacle course just to book a room. And we actually kind of we we, we gathered around Brian and I said, okay, how can we simplify the heck out of this? How can we get it down to three clicks to the book it button? That was our mantra back in the day. How do we simplify this to the point where it's three clicks to book it? Um, and in the course of doing that, we really kind of cut away all of the unnecessary elements and components of the service. And we got kind of right to the essence of search to listing to listing page to book it button. How do you get your team? I mean, so how do you, how many designers do you work with? Like, how did you build that? Yeah, it's one of the, um, I think it's any founder who comes from a design background would probably relate. Um, that, that is that transition point where you go from being an individual contributor to then overseeing uh, a team of designers. And, and there's, there's a, a very distinctive moment where you kind of hand the baton off, where it went from being your creation to now it's the creation of many people. Um, and so that was, that was definitely a learning lesson for me, uh, was getting to that, that point where you can build up trust in very talented and capable designers to kind of fulfill a vision for what the service could be. Letting go a little bit. Yeah, you gotta let go a little bit. And I don't think that's, it's one of the things that they didn't necessarily, you know, in a book about entrepreneurship or starting a company, they don't necessarily talk about that. But it's one of those things they kind of discovered along the way. Uh, and you just kind of figure it out for your own. You, you, you find mentors to talk about it with and, and other peers and colleagues. And you have a lot of techniques to um, help your design team kind of work on the product, create product, and be inspired. Can you talk a little bit about this? Well, I, I think it's, it's super important that, you know, if, if we're going to ask our team to, uh, to stay inspired and invent with their design, that, uh, that we, we help get out of the building. And we go out into the world and we, we see and learn from, uh, you know, some really inspiring touch points. So, the Eames have a special place kind of in my path as a designer and um, have a lot of influence in how we kind of think about things internally. If anything, the way that the Eames democratize design, we believe we're democratizing travel, and making it more accessible to people in more neighborhoods and local places worldwide. So uh, earlier this year, we had a chance to actually take the entire design team and go to the, the Eames house down in Los Angeles. And we had a chance to actually immerse ourselves in of a classic example of, of an experience, right? So the approach to the house, the kind of opening the door, the smell that you get when you walk inside, uh, it truly was kind of like a, an end-to-end -end example. Um, you know, other things that we do, um, we do uh, uh, film nights. So earlier this year, we, uh, we went out and took the whole team to see the movie Jiro Dreams of Sushi, which uh, to me is like such a classic example of of a master of their craft, right? This Jiro is so obsessed with crafting the perfect piece of sushi so that it lands in your mouth just the right way with the right amount of rice. And I think there's actually a lot of analogies to the craft that we have with, with our design. And you spent a lot of time working on reducing friction in the Airbnb system. Um, what are the biggest points of friction now that you're focused on getting rid of? I think it, one of the biggest points of friction is something that actually a lot of services are facing right now, which is um, as, as we've, as the internet has matured and we're now kind of in what I would call like the third act of the internet, it's like the first was about getting people online, the second was about connecting them when they're online, and now this decade is like, well, now people are going back offline. I've already seen a lot of services, Uber and TaskRabbit and many others that um, you consume the service through an app or the web, and then you end up actually completing the arc of the service offline. And I think there's something really special in, in that transition. So um, that's, that's, a lot of, that's something that we're thinking about a lot about right now, is how to reduce that friction. Yeah, um, I know one of the things that I, the point of friction where I find it sometimes frustrating is the key, the key pass. Um, so I don't know, anything with like smart locking type system you know, maybe something like that. There's a lot of interesting things happening in that space. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was interesting when, back when you were raising venture funding, um, the venture capitalists, uh, this series of venture capitalists, you talked to 
uh, saw it as a liability to have two oh, okay. co-founders, okay. designers on your team. Um, and now, you know, there's some venture firms that are created fully around finding the designer founder. Um, so tell us about your experience back then and, and how it's changed. Wow, talk about demoralizing. In 2008, we went out to raise some money and um, we had a couple proof points behind us. We, we could see how to, you know, exactly how we'd spend the money and start growing the team. Um, our numbers were up and to the right. There were very small numbers, but they were going up and to the right. And we thought, well, let's, let's go start to build the team out. Um, so we got introduced to you know a very um, you know notable group of investors in Silicon Valley, and every single person said no. Do you know how demoralizing that is when you're so passionate about your idea, and very credible people who have picked big winners in the past tell you that you're crazy, and that this idea will never work, that people will not stay in each other's homes at scale. Um, so I feel like I saw rejection in its purest form. <laughs> Would, was Paul Graham the first one who kind of... He was the first to believe in us. Yeah. Um, and and I, in those days, I feel like the way that Brian, Nate, and I uh, kind of interpreted that rejection was really as an invitation to keep going. Every rejection that we got was an invitation to keep going. And so uh, we got a lot of invitations that year. <laughs> and uh, to be honest with you, it was, it was just personally demoralizing. Like, I think probably any, any entrepreneur that's trying to get their idea off the ground um, inevitably will face rejection somewhere along the way. And for us, it was just about reframing it. Um, I distinctly remember this one moment where um, we were at University Cafe in Palo Alto pitching an investor um, over their smoothies that they make down there. And um, about halfway through, he just left. Are you serious? <laughs> And his, his smoothie's still on the table, and uh, it's their very first pitch, <laughs> right? We Did you just, send him like a Xerox copy of your 2.5 billion valuation year after you're done? <laughs> he, uh, yeah, and I remember looking at Brian and just thinking like, is this what pitching investors is supposed to be like? Like, we have no idea, right? Um, so kind of each experience had its own kind of quirk or moment of rejection, that was, that was really hard. But, you know, we just kept going. We were so passionate about this. We, we earnestly believed that one day there would be millions of people around the world sharing their homes with each other. And we just had to keep going until we could get that break. So, and then one of the liabilities was that you're a designer founder, but nowadays it seems like that's not only celebrated, but it seems like investors are actually looking for those people now. I think, I think it's come a long way, and maybe a little bit because of what, what John Maida talked about yesterday, which is that um, things are moving from kind of the speed of computers is, is less important now than the experience that that is created for the customer. And um, I think designers are just naturally inclined and trained to think about an end-to-end -end experience. And I remember distinctly a, a moment at RISD in the industrial design department. We were we were working on a, a medical device, and the, the place that we started the project was not actually in the studios. It was in the Rhode Island Hospital. We went as a, as a class to the Rhode Island Hospital. We had a chance to, to talk with doctors, talk with nurses, talk with patients, and then the pivotal moment was when we actually laid down in the hospital bed. And we had the existing device applied to us, and we thought, wow, that's really uncomfortable. And it was in that moment where we were like, we were like married to the problem, right? We felt it firsthand, and we could empathize with the person we're designing for, for the audience. I think like going for that level of, of, of empathy um, can inform you uh, in, in such interesting ways. And, and that's a thread that we've carried through even to today of going to meet people, get out of the comfort of the office and go out into the world and actually like actually meet your customers, talk to them firsthand. We knew our first 30 or 40 hosts on a first name basis. Some of them we even knew their birthdays. Some of them are still on my cell phone. Like, that's how closely we were connected to our customers in the early days. Because again, like the thousand paths, they helped us narrow in on something that was truly valuable to them. And that's what we built. How do you maintain that um, connection to your customer and maintaining that kind of experience when you scale to something so large? Well, I think, 
there's, there's one thing that's also been a constant thread is that everyone on the team is also a customer. We actually, we blur the line of, of the community and the company, it's, it's actually a blurred line, where everybody in the company is a guest. Everyone's used the service as a traveler. Uh, we provide a stipend every quarter to allow team members to go out to the world and travel. And actually about a third of the company are active hosts on Airbnb. And you know, I can't tell you how many bugs we've found, how many uh, product ideas have come up, just simply by using the product ourselves. Um, and at the end of the day, it, it gives us a deeper, more profound sense of empathy for the audience we're designing for. And you know, one thing about the experience of the sharing economy is trust obviously plays a huge um, part of that entire experience. Like, are there specific things that you guys have kind of built into the product over the years? Um, maybe the less obvious things, but um, about maintaining that type of trust. I, well, certainly starting off, it was a really hard. And you have a, a two-sided marketplace. You have you know, buyers and sellers, guests and hosts, and, and you have to grow both simultaneously. You can't really have one without the other. Um, and in the case of our business, trust is, is kind of the, the, the lubricant that makes it all work. Now, I kind of think of, of the service as like a car engine. It has all these moving parts, the pistons, the valves, the hoses, the belts. And the thing that, that makes it move forward, the, the lubricant, is, is trust. That's what moves our business forward. Um, so we think, think a lot about this. Um, you know, in, in the early days, um, well, there's actually three things that make it work. There's reviews, there's profiles, and there's the payment system. So we're able to uh, allow people to transact safely and securely. We allow them to see uh, who they're mutual friends with through the site, we have a feature called social connection. So you can actually browse through Airbnb and just stay with people who are mutual friends, or people who graduated from the same place that you did. Um, and ultimately, I think probably the biggest thing is, is social proof. If you see your friends using the service, you're more inclined and, and you just trust it more. I know we were talking about this a little bit backstage, less about design, but you know the whole policy issue that's going on with Airbnb and various places right now, in New York specifically. Um, what's, what's your take on that? Is, is Airbnb kind of rolling out um, different types of solutions um, across the board or just in New York, or, or how are you guys doing with that? Um, I think it's an example of, of an innovation entering the world that is, is ahead of where policies were drafted. And actually, history is full of examples of this. Um, one thing I discovered is that when ATM machines came out in the 1970s, they were actually illegal in many states. And it took almost a decade for ATMs to become a commonplace convenience. Um, same thing for VCRs. The first VCR patent was in the 1950s, and it took a couple decades for the VCR to get past the movie industry and actually become a commonplace every day. So I think this is part of the course. Okay. And my final question for you, do you think designers make better founders? <laughs> um, do I think designers make better founders? I think Brian and I alone would have designed a really interesting company. Without Nate, our technical co-founder, it would have been an incomplete family. Okay. So yes, maybe. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Joe. <laughs> <laughs>